Well, good morning, and it is daylight savings time, so uh, for all you sleepers out there, now I know who you are. <laughs> I watch you. Uh, you don't get off today. You got that extra hour. Um, and Warren, so good to see you for the first time since your accident. What a what a blessing. Um, so grateful. Uh, think of the Apostle's words. Uh, uh, you would have brought us sorrow upon sorrow if you had been killed in that accident. And looking at that car, uh, it's amazing that uh, God in His grace kept you from serious injury. So, so grateful to see you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, we are studying the book of Proverbs. Uh, we are in the 25th chapter, and we are starting in verse 11 this morning. We will skip a few because uh, we have seen similar Proverbs teaching similar ideas uh, in the past. So those we will skip and we'll and I'll identify those for you right now. Here we begin in 2511. Apples of gold in a silver sepulcher. Our words, actually, this was, a, this was new to me because I had always read this proverb as words, but it's really... It's the result of words. It's actually a decision that comes about by careful use of language and words. So the emphasis is not so much on having a pithy word in a context, but rather it is careful and appropriate words in a context that bring about a decision. And that's my job to show you that. Uh, made appropriate to its circumstance is how the proverb ends. Uh, we skip 12 because it's something similar that we've had. We pick up in 13. Like the coolness of snow at the time of harvest is a trustworthy messenger to one who sends him. He refreshes his Master, The master would be the one that sent the message in the first place. Fourteen, clouds without rain, uh, without wind and no rain is a man who boasts of gifts he does not give. Fifteen, through patience a ruler is persuaded. And this is such an interesting contrast. A soft tongue shatters a bone. What is that all about? Uh, 16. If you have honey, eat what you require, lest you have more than enough of it and are sick. Or vomit it is actually the word. 17. Make your foot scarce from your neighbor's house, lest you have he have enough of you and hate you. Uh, 18, 19, and 20, we're going to skip because we've had similar proverbs to those. And we go to 21. If the one who hates you is hungry, give him food. If he is thirsty, give him to drink. And so... We get the consequences of that in 22 with the explanation. That's the word for. For burning coals, you are actually, it's the idea of stacking like pancakes on top of one's head, burning embers that would create great pain on his head. But here's the benefit to your kindness. Look how it ends. The Lord will bless you. He will repay you, it says. Okay, well, here are the Proverbs 
in our study this morning, apples of gold in a silver sepulcher. Most of the English translations that we have translate this proverb in reverse order. So they begin with a, a fitly word, an appropriate word. Only the New American Standard begins with the word apples, which is the literal word order of the proverb. It is talking about a proper decision. That's what words ultimately translate into, the end result of one's communication. It is so interesting to me that the book of Proverbs spends so much time talking about the way we communicate with one another, tone that we use, words that we use. And we'll see that in this proverb right here. But this opening image, uh, apples of gold in a silver sepulcher. You walk into a room and it, it absolutely gravitates your attention, your eyes. You can't see anything else. This is an amazing thing to look at. It fills up the room. That's the idea. And that's the way appropriate words and appropriate communication should be in making a decision. This opening image, apples of gold, metal, bright, immediately draws our attention. Sepulcher of silver, a sepulcher with golden apples surrounding it. Magnificent. Okay, well here is the rubber meets the road illustration of this proverb. It occurs in 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 7. The son of Solomon, a man by the name of Rehoboam, consulted the elders who served his father Solomon regarding how he should respond to the people who felt overtaxed, burdened by the government. And the elders gave him this counsel. If you will be a servant to these people and serve them this day, speak words of kindness to them, they'll be your servants forever. Now, think about those words that they gave him. Servants, serve, kindness. That's really the job of a king. The job of a king is to take care of his people. That is the moral order that God has established. He made you sovereign ruler over a territory, over a people. Your job is to serve those people. It, we see the same thing in families. We are to take care of our family first. That's the will of God for us. And when it comes to the church, we are to take care of one another, look after one another. That's the order of things. Well, here's what happened. Um, it was time for Rehoboam to make a decision, so he spoke to the people. And he spoke harshly to them. My father made your yoke heavy. I'll make it heavier, he said. My father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions. And he split the kingdom, north and south. The tragedy is that the northern kingdom is like the Methodist church in America. It never had a good theological day. And they just went off. But... Uh, Look at this. Look at this closing, a decision appropriate to the circumstance. So in the words that we use, we want to evaluate where we are, when we are, how we are, and what the communication is really all about. That's the idea. A spoken decision at a precise time, at a precise place, that takes wisdom. That's real skill. 
And that's what the proverb is saying. And there's a beauty to that. Okay, here is the beauty of communication, of language. It's in the 13th proverb. Like the coolness of snow in a time of harvest is a trustworthy messenger. The top line opens with a comparison. Like the, the coolness of snow is a reference to the cold north wind that comes across the land in the Near East. The word snow is a figure for refreshment. It's an image. And it comes at a time, a context, of a hot Arab summer in the harvest. Now, archaeology, we have found, ice caves. They would actually take big chunks of ice from the top of mountains and put them in caves, and the workers at harvest would go and sit in these caves and refresh themselves with the cold of the ice. The idea of this comparison is that the ice caves are like the trustworthy envoy. He refreshes his master like a cold drink of water on a hot day. That would equate to the harvest period. This phrase, to the one who sends him. See, the proverb is about a reliable person. His value to the individual who sent him. No telephones, no telegraphs, no internet back then, no. It, your messages were delivered by a person. And you needed a faithful person to actually send that message in the way you wanted to send it. And that, says the proverb, is like a cold drink of water, refreshing harvesters in their season. This word refresh is literally causing a spirit to return. It vitalizes a person. That's the idea. And that's the literal word. It revitalizes known as the loyalty of a messenger and his accuracy, his representation to prove uh, a message is a great blessing. Here's how it's used. Practical way. Genesis 45, 27. This is the actual word. The revival of a spirit. When Jacob heard all the words that Joseph had told his sons, and he saw the carts that Joseph had sent to carry him. The Scripture says that the spirit of that old man was revived. That's our word. What's interesting for you and me is that our faith is actually built on the words of a messenger. It is the beginning and the end of our Lord Jesus. The night that the shepherds were out, remember the angelic host brought tidings of great joy. They delivered a message. And at the end, at His resurrection, John chapter 20, go and tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene took that message and delivered it to the disciples. That is our faith. It was delivered by a messenger. How careful we need to be in conveying messages to one another. Here's 14 clouds without rain, without wind and rain. The big talker. The complimentary proverb to the faithful messenger is the unfaithful boaster. He comes boasting through a promised gift. But the gift 
that he boasts about he didn't give, or maybe he never had it in the first place. The proverb opens with weather, a meteorological trio here. Look at this, cloud, winds, rain. We get these massive clouds and we see the, the lightning in them and we say, boy, we finally are going to get a rain. And then it doesn't rain. That's Oklahoma City for you. <laughs> uh, the addition of the wind here ties it all into one thought. It's a big storm. That's what we're looking at. And it is tied to, look at this in the proverb, a man. Now why is that important? Because that word man is the common word for ground, dirt. It's the man that was created, that lived in the garden, and he was nothing but dirt. So he's the common, ordinary variety man, which means ground. And this man boasts. It's literally he praises himself. Kind of a disgusting thought from the book of Proverbs that instructs us to be humble and live in the fear of the Lord. This is the same word used in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 15, where Pharaoh's officials praised Sarai's beauty to Pharaoh. That's the same word. It's a type of uh, arrogance tied to an individual, a self-consciousness, conscious uh, mind, brash, bold. Here it is. It's Ben-Hadad, the Assyrian king, who threatened the northern kingdom, 1 Kings chapter 20. Uh, he boasted so cocksure of himself and his army, boasting before the battle, but God wiped out his troop overnight. But see, that's mankind in general. He naturally boasts because he doesn't understand the sovereignty of God and his all-wise providence. It's not a part of his life. He thinks he creates his own reality. Uh, here's James' warning about this very thing. James chapter 4, 13 and 14. Come now, you who say today, tomorrow, we'll go do such and such in a city, spend a year, make a profit. Why, you don't know what tomorrow is, he says. You're just a mist. A mist. You can't shake a mist. Can't drill a hole in a mist. I had uh, Jeff Thornbush sat in my Friday morning Bible study for over 10 years. He sat right in the back corner. And uh, he had the most wonderful white beard. And I would always tease him, well, Jeff, we're getting close to Christmas. Are you growing that beard? Are you going to do some Santa Claus runs this year? God gave him the most perfect white hair. And on Labor Day, he took a nap and he never woke up. We were devastated. And I, I look at that empty chair back in the corner, and I'm reminded, we're just a mist. Jeff is there, but he's not there. He's gone. That's what our life is, is all about. And it's, uh, it's depressing almost. But you don't know what event tomorrow will bring. I had a business partner who started a law firm. But back in the 60s, in his earliest days, he told a story about working for Eckerd Drug. That was his client. And Eckerd's was trying to expand their chain. And he knew of a man who owned four drug stores in Oklahoma. 
So he got together with him. He said those negotiations were so hard, like licking through limestone, he said. And, uh, but he finally got the guy to the table. It was the day of closing. And you know how closings are. You got papers going everywhere, signing. You're in the middle, sign here, sign there. This is for this, this is for that. And suddenly, a man broke into the conference room and said, the President of the United States has just been shot in Dallas, Texas. Well, they all got up, and they went to the TV, and that man who was selling his four drugstores was so shaken by that event that he put his papers in his briefcase and he left and the deal never got done. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know. The point is, this man who boasts of a gift, this word gift used six times in the Old Testament, is used for exchanging derivatives. Gold, silver, wages. And the phrase does not give is our word in the inspired language meaning deception, disappointment. It's used in Jeremiah chapter 10 in verse 14 for the failure of idols. The prophet declares there's no breath in them. There's, meaning, there's no life in their lungs, in their heart. It doesn't beat. It's just an emblem. So is the observable wisdom here in the proverb to learn. People come with great fanfare. I'll do this. I'll do that. I can do this. Oh, sure, I can handle that. Like a great meteorological event. Big clouds, lots of thunder, lightning, and then we get no rain. That's the idea. It's all talk. They were just a bunch of duds. Does the name Isaiah Wilson mean anything to you? I didn't think so. Isaiah Wilson had the unique distinction of being the first player in the NFL draft in 2020 to be cut from a pro football team. Now, in the first round, there's only 32 teams. So these first 32 players are very valuable to a franchise. They pay lots of money for them. So he signed with the Tennessee Titans. And after one year, they traded him. They traded him and took a big loss financially, really a fire sale, to the Miami Dolphins. Isaiah is six foot six and weighs 350 pounds. Now, God gave him that body not to go to the local library and read poetry on Sunday afternoon. He didn't give him that body to dance in the ballet at the Met. God gave him that body to glorify him. That's his responsibility and accountability, the gift that he had given him. Well, the trade took place because at that time, the Miami Dolphins head coach was a man by the name of Brian Flores. And Brian bought him for pennies on the dollar. The reason he did so, because he thought there was common ground between he and Isaiah. They, went to the, they lived in the same neighborhood. They went to the same high school. He thought, I'll be able to reform him. He lasted with the Dolphins a week. He didn't show up for his physical. He was late for his first meeting. Faster than you can say, Miami whammy, he was on the street. What I found interesting in the story was the general manager of the Tennessee Titans. This is the guy that pounded the table to pick Wilson for the franchise. Here's what he said. The man we interviewed, 
the man we scrutinized thought and evaluated so carefully in the draft. After we signed him, he never showed up. That's the proverb. That's it right here. Here's 15. Through patience, a ruler is persuaded. Uh, here we have a single proverb teaching us patience, tenderness in a confrontation to win the day. Once again, look at us. We're talking about communication, the words that we use, the way we talk to one another. This word ruler suggests a king, a magistrate, a high official. The proverb is the picture of getting the man to put the gun down, to release the hostage. We are getting him from point A to point B. Our top line opens through, by or through, and actually it's the word length. It's a reference to time. That's the way the Semitic mind thinks about patience. Length. It's used in 2 Samuel chapter 3 in verse 1 for the long fight between the house of Saul and the house of David. Patience. Length. It was used in Genesis chapter 6 in verse 15 of that long arc. It took a lot of time to build it. And it took a long time to walk the length of it. That's this word. And when it's connected to time, we translate it as patience, forbearance. It took a long time, but we actually were successful to get this ruler who could represent any form of authority and Here's the interesting word, persuade. It's the same word that's used of the, the criminal element in Proverbs chapter 1, uh, trying to take the young man who had been raised in the family of wisdom and try to, here's the word, Proverbs 1.10, entice. We want you to join the gang, they tell him. Here's all the criminal element that is reaching out to him. So what's the first, what's the first real challenge for your children? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Conform to us. Conform to our standard. Now, Line two, the and, that's important because it connects the two thoughts. A soft tongue, a figure that brings comfort. Soft is the word tender. It's used of the eyes of Leah. She needed sunglasses. They didn't make them back then. Genesis 29, 17. She had tender eyes, soft eyes, delicate eyes. And here's what's fascinating about the proverb. You break the bone, not with a baseball bat, dummy. No, you do it with tenderness. You see that? That word shatters is found in 1 Samuel 4.18. It's used of the broken neck of the priest Eli. When the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines, he was so struck that he leaned back in his chair, fell, and broke his neck. That's this word, broken. A person at court, through patience, warm, sensitive communication, speech, that's a way of thinking. And it moves the needle with a person. See how practical Proverbs are? This is the way we need to persuade one another. Here's 16. If you have funny, honey, eat what you require. Wise exhortation 
calling for moderation and self-control, not overindulgence in something even as sweet and beneficial as honey. We open the top line with a condition representing good fortune if you have found. That's the way we open. Now, this is depicted as wild honey, which is uniquely sweet and potent. But the word found is the prize because it indicates it comes without any effort at all. I'm walking down the street. There's a quarter. I didn't earn it, but it's there. That's found. That's the idea. This is apparently Samson's experience as he described it in his riddle. Judges 14, he found this honey and honeycomb. The command in the top line is eat. Now, that's from the garden, Genesis 2.16. And you go, why did you spend time telling me that? That's so obvious. No, it's not so obvious because you've got to understand the proverb. Look at how it's tied to a qualifier. What you require. That word require is used 39 times in the Old Testament. It means enough, sufficient. It is a rain barrel full of water and you can't put an eye drop of water into that barrel more or it'll start spilling over. That's the word. Enough, sufficient. Here's the way Malachi the prophet used it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. I will pour out a blessing in my abundance that cannot be exhausted. That word exhausted is our word sufficient. You're going to have everything to the brim said the prophet. Now here's line two. There's lest, which is logic, rational. You have more than enough of it. You eat until you want no more. That's the idea. But the human nature of man always wants more. What do I want more of? when I've got a billion dollars? I want two. I want four. And now, you become repulsive. That's the idea. You become sick. Overindulgence takes what is good, what is sweet, what is pleasant, what is beneficial, and makes it repulsive to people. It's called greed. It's called gluttony. It's called drunkenness. The Apostle Paul, regarding his own personal walk with himself, you know, uh, Job made the comment, I made a covenant with myself. Well, here's Paul's covenant with himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, I will not be mastered by anything. He controls himself and he keeps himself on the straight and narrow with that principle for himself. I will not be mastered by anything. The skill for living is everything is free. Everything is open. Everything is yours. God created it. But you must exemplify control. And you must exercise that over yourself all the time. Here's 17. I want you to look how personal this proverb is. The top line, it's your foot, your neighbor. And line two, it's you and you. The application of the proverb is don't be self-unaware. Your translation may have seldom. It's the idea of, of something expensive, uh, making scarce, like precious, costly ointment or 
jewels, very valuable, perfume. Uh, note the foot. The foot is a figure. Um, we say that man has a great eye for the ball. We know what that means. He has great hands. We know what that means. He, he has great feet. We don't think of it in terms of hands or eye or feet. We think of the whole person. It's the individual. It's just the part that is identified that we are impressed with. That's the idea. And that's what we have with foot. It's just a figure for the entire person. Now look at this. Neighbor's house. So it's not a relative. What's a neighbor in Proverbs? He's a man on the street. He's the man who's in the car next to you on the expressway. That's the neighbor. And it stands for your association with him. Lest, there's the rationale, he have enough of you. Now, enough, that's the same word as we had in verse 16 for sufficient. Can't put another drop in the rain barrel. You have, you're all full up with him in your presence. That's the idea. So now, because you have taken advantage, he now hates you. Pretty harsh words, stern words. Now, there goes your name that's supposed to be worth silver and gold, much more valuable. There goes your reputation. There goes your testimony. That's the idea. Um, true friendship values another's privacy and allows for space. You see, my job is to enrich my neighbor. My job is to benefit my neighbor. Instead, what's taking place here is I'm taking away from my neighbor. And I am, I have pushed my level of tolerance till the point that I become a nuisance. Here's 21. Uh, we're familiar with this one. The one who hates you is hungry. A proverb that just screams to us the inspiration and authority of the Bible. Men don't think like this at all. This is supernatural. Uh, Tony Bennett sings to us, I want to be around and pick up the pieces when somebody breaks your heart. When somebody takes you down then I want, he sings, a front row seat. And I want to sit in the gallery. And I want to applaud from there. For revenge is sweet, he sings. And somebody breaks your heart like you broke mine. Now, that's normal. That's the way we all normally think. The top line opens, if presents us with two presuppositions. The first, the neighbor, which is represented by the word one, if the one, or you may have the word enemy to clarify the circumstance. It presupposes that he is at enmity. That's a good King James word, enmity, a feeling of condition or hostility against someone. And the second presupposition, this third party is in a urgent need. Urgent need. That's hunger. That's thirst. Two immediate needs for life. Now, wisdom, the skill for living, gives you and me a command. Here's the supernatural life. Command. Augustine said it. Command what you will, Lord but will what you command. I have no power within myself to live God's commands. Do it. 
in me, through me. And so, our job is to give. That's the command. That's the supernatural life. That is the life of Christ reproduced in the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Supernatural. You're walking on water. But that's your opportunity in space and time, what we call life. Here is a great opportunity to glorify God and affect Him as well. Look at this, and if. It's actually a figure that tells us our presupposition of this enemy's need is still the same. He's now thirsty. So the second command, like the first, and in the same construction, is we are to give him to drink. And that is our job. Here is the proverb distilled. And I love this comment. It ministered to me. The enemy is to be supported in every need one knows him to be in. You do that, here's what happens. 22. See that four? The burning coals? Four gives us the outcome of meeting the needs of an enemy. It's direct address, meaning you, you, you. It balances in the proverb by the Lord. And that's the covenant name. Now, remember, proverbs are like a putting green. You know, you get out there on the tee and you just swing away and uh, you can swing as hard as you want and the ball goes everywhere. But when you get on the putting surface, you've got to be technically correct. Balance, pace of the ball, the cut of the green, everything. Everything is important. That's the proverb. The proverb is so small, we've got to be technically correct in every detail. So, I want to help you be technically correct in this proverb. You've got the word Lord, that's the covenant name. That's Exodus 3. All right? When you see the covenant name in a proverb, it suddenly, you erase every word in the proverb except that one, and we go right there and we begin to think. So let's think about this word and what Lord actually can mean. And here it is. When Moses stood before the burning bush, that's where we got this name for the first time. Undefinable. That's I am who I am. Now, Moses said, I can't do your assignment because I'm slow of speech, remember? And what's interesting is that God never changed His mouth, did He? He didn't say, well, I, I, I'll correct that. Now you'll be Dale Carnegie, you know. No, He didn't do that. He left him in his weakness. Left him just as he was. But there were two changes that did take place instantly. There were two signs, remember? He said, what do you have in your hand? It was a staff. Throw it down, it became a serpent. Grab it by its tail, it becomes a staff again. That's the first sign. And the second sign, remember, you take your hand, car, ordinary variety, garden variety hand, you put it in your cloak, you pull it out, now it's leprous. Oh! You put it back, and now it's ordinary again. He made those changes. Didn't make those changes to his mouth, but he made those changes. What does the name Yahweh, the covenant name, Lord, what does it do? It changes the physical world in accordance with his will. Because every time he did the, 
those signs, he was reminded, by the name, I will be with you. What's the Great Commission? I'll be with you. There is power to that. Power for you. Power for me. As we do to our enemies, as He commands us to do, they'll be changed. First of all, it's going to hurt them. That's explained by the stacks of coals on their head. You see, in Proverbs 6.28, this same Solomon wrote about those hot coals in the context of adultery. Can a, a man walk on hot coals and not expect to be burned? The idea of hot coals, it's painful. And you're going to create pain with him. But here is the payoff. You're doing the will of God. And you are creating an opportunity for change. Real change. In that person. By doing the supernatural. Treating an enemy with kindness. See how important the Lord is when you find it in a proverb? It teaches us everything about the context and the texture of that proverb. My friends, you want to have power in your life. You want to have a great testimony among men. Be kind to your enemies. Do good to them who hate you and despise you, said Jesus. You do that, oh, it's going to be painful for them. That's not your issue. What you really want to see is a change for them that they may have what you have, the love of God in your life. That's powerful. And that is what the proverb tells you to seek and find. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be together today and to study Your Word. What a joy and privilege it is to be with Your people at Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, and study the Word of God as it is revealed to us in the Proverbs. Bless this church, the elders, the deacons, the service that they render to us. That's leadership. For they take care of us and watch over us. And we're grateful for that. And we finish this study today in the powerful name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Can I